going to go into the public hearing on Senate Bill 5198. And uh, Riley, would you please brief the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, Riley Benj, staff to the committee. Before you is Senate Bill 5198 concerning the sale or lease of manufactured mobile home communities and the property on which they sit. The Manufactured Mobile Home Landlord Tenant Act, or MHLTA, regulates the relationship between the owner of a manufactured mobile home community and the owner of the manufactured or mobile home. There are a variety of notice requirements arising, <clears throat> excuse me, arising under the MHLTA, including notice of closure and notice of sale. The bill before you modifies the existing notice of sale and notice of closure requirements. The notice of sale is modified to include intent to lease the manufactured mobile home community or MHC and to include both public and private notices that an MHC is for sale or lease. The notice of closure is modified to require MHC landlords to provide tenants with three years notice before closure or conversion of the MHC. The three-year closure notice requirement is reduced to 24 months if the landlord provides relocation assistance of at least $17,000 for a multi-section home or of at least $11,000 for a single-section home, or 12 months if the landlord provides that same relocation assistant and compensates tenants for the loss of their homes at market value or $5,000, whichever is greater. The bill before you also creates new notice requirements, a notice of opportunity to purchase an MHC and a notice of intent to consider purchasing or leasing an MHC. Under this bill, a landlord must provide each tenant with a notice of opportunity to purchase the MHC once any notice is first made that the MHC is for sale or lease. If a qualified tenant organization or other eligible organization provides notice to a landlord expressing an intent to consider purchasing or leasing the MHC, the landlord may not make a final acceptance of an offer from another entity for 12 months. A fiscal note has been requested but is not yet available. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions for Riley? Yes, we do. Senator Gildon. Thanks, Riley. Um, the notice of intent to uh, purchase from the community, does that have to be, does that have to come with any type of um, loan approval or any type of down payment earnest money or anything like that? Um, the bill is silent on that question, okay. Senator. All right, any other questions? All right, Madam Vice Chair, this is your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, I'm Noelle Frame, State Senator for the 36th District, uh, bringing forward this legislation today. Um, I often say that our job is to represent our districts and serve the but to serve the entire state of Washington, and this bill is a good example of that because uh, I don't really have manufactured home communities in my district, but I think they uh, are a very big part of the overall housing story. Um, I don't need to reiterate what we've already heard from countless speakers today about our housing crisis, but what I will say, what I was motivated to support this legislation um, is that I believe that manufactured home communities are important to uh, a port important part of the story to preserve affordable housing stock. We need to expand supply. We need to expand supply of affordable housing. We also need to maintain the affordable housing stock that we have. And our manufactured housing is just such a unique scenario where you have homeowners that own their homes, but not the land underneath. It presents a really uh, unique and challenging circumstance um, that creates a really high threat for displacement. Um, and because these are some of our most affordable units uh, in the state, uh, if those homes go away, the threat for those homeowners to rapidly go into homelessness is very high. Uh, so manufactured home communities, which you're noticing here, I'm not saying mobile homes because these are rarely actual, actually mobile. Uh, manufactured home communities need a, a different type of treatment to preserve this important affordable housing stock. I commend the bill to you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for the prime sponsor? I'm not seeing any. So we have, I believe, 33 people signed in to testify, which does not leave us with two minutes. We're going to have to go to a minute 30, if my math is right. Uh, and Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are going to call the first panel to
two of which I believe are in person, Michelle Thomas and Andrew Calkins, uh, followed by Joanna Grist, who we believe is remote. And on deck will be Brad Tower, Ryan Erickson, and Christina Mays. Do you want to start with in person? Yeah, I think. Okay. Thank you so much. I am Michelle Thomas again, um, and here pro on Senate Bill 5198. Thank you so much, Senator Frame, for sponsoring it. Manufactured housing is the most accessible path to home ownership for lower and fixed income households, including BIPOC households, seniors, and people with disabilities. And this bill is absolutely critical to solving Washington's affordable housing crisis. As we've already discussed today in several other bill hearings, uh, Washington already needs 1 million homes by 2044, and the vast majority of that need, 72%, is for people who are extremely low and very low income households. That is the manufactured housing homeowner population. If we continue to lose manufactured housing communities at a high rate, it will make Washington's housing crisis much worse and much harder to solve. This bill incentivizes and provides meaningful opportunity for permanent preservation by nonprofits who will keep rents within reach of homeowners. And this is a critical component of this bill because rent increases are destabilizing homeowners and are causing displacement in addition to particle closures. It is in the interest of the state for nonprofits to get in and purchase these properties quickly for long-term affordability and preservation. Please do pass, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Again, I'm Andrew Culkins, testifying on behalf of the King County Housing Authority and the Association of Washington Housing Authorities in support of Senate Bill 5198. Manufactured housing communities are a valuable but dwindling affordable home ownership resource throughout the state, and we need to make sure our state policies ensure that tenants, nonprofits, and public entities, including housing authorities, have ample opportunities to preserve them and prevent their future closure. This is a challenge that our members across the state are hearing about. KCHA in King County has helped preserve four manufactured housing communities over the years. The most recent, um, a large community in Redmond, Friendly Village. Uh, we find these communities are often home to tight-knit groups of residents who've lived near one another for many years. Um, the manufactured housing communities in general can allow seniors to age in place and, as Michelle mentioned, also provide a real al alternative to traditional home ownership. This bill builds on previous requirements regarding manufactured housing community sales by creating a real opportunity to purchase um, for eligible organizations to step in, negotiate in good faith, and potentially purchase the park. We like this bill because it's providing multiple pathways forward. Uh, the reality is that it can take considerable time to put together a deal to actually purchase a manufactured housing community, even when it's a large entity um, or a tenant organization. We think preservation of manufactured housing communities is extremely important for our overall um, affordable housing efforts and ask you to move this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you. Joanna. Uh, thank you, Chair Cooter and members of the committee for hearing this Senate Bill 5198. I'm here speaking in support on behalf of AARP. Uh, Joanna Griff speaking, I think I said. Uh, AARP has nearly 900,000 members in the state and one thing is very clear, 77% of people want to remain in their homes as they age, also known as aging in place. Mobile home and manufactured communities must be viewed as part of the overall housing supply that Washington so desperately needs and, and must maintain. Uh, more than 40% of residents in, in these communities are older adults on fixed incomes. They've chosen these communities because they're affordable. They offer a sense of community and connectedness. Many move here uh, when children have grown up, a spouse has passed away, or they can no longer maintain a single family home. The biggest challenge to living in one of these communities is the reality, the impact, the stress, and the overall well being of an individual if uh, they're given 12 month notice that they need to move, um, often leaving behind their home. And because of the transportation cost to safely relocate the unit, the uh, unavailability of an alternate location. The legislature needs to support these communities. This bill will allow nonprofit housing authorities or housing agencies um, or uh, to purchase community and preserve it as a affordable housing for seniors, many of whom are feeling very ignored by current policies. Affordable, accessible, and safe housing are top priorities for everyone in Washington state. 
let's preserve what we have to keep seniors housed safely and securely in their homes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's call forward in person Brad Tower, Ryan Erickson, and Christina, Christina Mays. And on deck, we'll have in person Arthur West, and then on Zoom, Stacy Valenzuela and Ishbel Dickens. Go ahead, Brad. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll defer to my client first, if that's all right with you. Of course. Uh, hello, thank you for having me. My name is Ryan Erickson. Uh, I run a company called Commonwealth Real Estate Services. Uh, and uh, my job is uh, to support affordable housing in Washington State. Um, and uh, this is a, something I do for my career and also I take very personally. I think that um, housing is a, a need that we all have and can all appreciate and understand. Um, sometimes the uh, uh, best intentions uh, don't produce the best results though. We can all have the best intentions, but we still need to hire an architect and a designer and qualify people to build our, our buildings. Um, and I am against this bill. Uh, last year, 2022, only 129 sites were uh, uh, taken down in Washington state out of 72,000 uh, sites in the state. Um, my company personally added 70 brand new homes uh, and uh, so we are uh, very for adding more home sites uh, in the state. Um, I think a, a big issue with uh, restricting the closure of these um, is twofold. One, uh, oftentimes when you have an old car that's unsafe and polluting, uh, at some point you need to replace that car. Um, and. Uh, you know, at some point we need to have communities next to transit that are uh, built greener and better for the environment. So there, there are reasons at times to, um, to build fresh. Um, also, as a private home, homeowner, I own two manufactured houses. Um, if my family gets cancer or has some problem and I need to sell, if I'm not even allowed to look at offers to sell for more than a year, that uh, would have a negative impact on the health of my family, and I don't think that I should be re restricted in that way. Um, thank you for your time. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Brad Tower here today on behalf of Commonwealth Real Estate Services. I do think it's important to point out that Commonwealth manages properties on behalf of other people. They are not the owners of the underlying property, and we do work with tenant groups, and we support those tenant groups. And we actually think that in the, in the circumstances where a sales opportunity comes up, that those tenant groups are, uh, should be encouraged to bid. The more bidders in, the better for the marketplace. But uh, unfortunately, this bill is gonna have um, a negative effect in two different ways that I think uh, the committee should consider. Uh, first, this is a disproportionate burden on one particular type of property owner that's going to disincentivize investment in new housing of this type in areas where it's very compatible with the land use. In the more, uh, right on the, on the edges of, of urban development, where places where these typically will form up as new parks with a with this type of property singled out for this particular type of restriction, it's going to discourage people from investing in that. Second, with the additional timelines, we are increasing the price of the transaction significantly. And one of the ways in which we're doing that is we're preventing the use of a 1031 exchange to shield the transaction from capital gains. So we just heard a lot of testimony in other bills about the need to move rapidly, and that's the case here as well. A potential 12-month delay without having a bona fide offer on the table from a tenant group would negate the ability of any other bidders to use a 1031 exchange and therefore increase the overall price of that particular property. Uh, I see I'm out of time, but I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Christy Mays. I'm a small business owner and housing provider here in Washington and have been my entire life, or working life, I should say. Um, I'm here today to ask for your no vote on 5198, but I am willing to work with the primary sponsors of it because I do think there's some potential areas that we can come together on. 
Um, first, I'd like to point out that the bill conflates community sales with community closures. When communities sale, they aren't usually closing, and there's a lot of fear around communities closing. So I think we need to be careful there and make that distinction that just because there's a sale doesn't mean that it's closing. Um, I'd like to point out the bill also doesn't do anything to bring new housing inventory to the market, and we're very interested in that. You'll hear from a lot of residents today who really value this type of housing. We like to provide this type of housing. It is a necessary element outside of the public publicly funded housing that you guys have been listening to and hearing about today. So we'd like to work with you on providing more of this housing stock to the industry if we can. One of the things this bill does is it actually adds that three year delay. So if you have somebody who is going to close a community and redevelop, perhaps to take 50 manufactured housing spaces and turn it into 300 spaces, we're now delaying that process. And we've heard so much today about the sense of urgency to bring more housing stock to the market and we can't seem to get to that fast enough. So this would add to that delay and we'd like to try to avoid that. So I ask for your consideration on if you've got somebody who is closing a community and who can bring more product to the market that maybe special consideration be given in that scenario. And we agree, we don't like to displace residents. It's not our goal, it's not the business we're in, but sometimes it's a necessary element to, to bring more housing to the market. That's why we've worked so hard in years past to make sure that we've worked on the relocation fund administered by Commerce to make sure there's more money and more housing types that money can be applied to. Finally, yeah. uh, real quick, watch for a bill uh, very soon. Um, it models the Oregon bill for resident right or opportunity to purchase. Uh, that is a bill that that we can get behind that helps bring the parties together in the events that the residents are uh, interested in buying the community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll just note as a prime sponsor, I would welcome um, working with you on amendments. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you again. Um, we don't have any questions for this panel? No. Okay, great. Um, let's call forward in person Arthur West, and then next on uh, Zoom will be Stacy Valenzuela and Ishbel Dickens. On deck for uh, testifiers on Zoom will be Don Lebo, Linda Herrer, and John Steve Herrer. Go ahead, Arthur. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Arthur West. I like the intent of this bill, but I think the it goes too much with the stick and not enough with the carrot. I think that it also shows a certain blindness to alternative housing things, whereas we're just trying to, to do a last ditch defense on what we have of these. I think alternative housing, including the manufactured housing, needs to be a part of the solution and we need to vastly expand that. And I, I don't know how much a manufactured housing unit costs, but it's not three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars. And so, to the extent we're going to pump four billion dollars into the developers market, we need to pump some of that into uh, expanding, greatly expanding the amount of affordable housing in non-traditional methods. Because if we keep going, thinking within the box, giving money to the developers to build four hundred to thousand dollar units. We're not going to solve the problem, no matter how many billion dollars we, Arthur, we throw I need at you it. To speak to the bill, please. okay. This bill penalizes owners of these units rather than making it more uh, more probable that people want to buy these. This makes it no one in their right mind would want to own a, a mobile home park if you got to pay everyone eleven thousand uh, dollars. It also is defective in the penalties. The penalty for the Attorney General's enforcement action is only $10,000. If I owned a park like that, I'd send the Attorney General a $10,000 check and go sell it the next day. So um, this bill has a I, good I intent. You Thank you. Up. It has a good intent, but we need to have more of these type of units, not just depend the amount that we have right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to reiterate that Linda Harar and John Steve Harar uh, are on deck. They're currently missing from Zoom, so I want to flag some additional folks to be ready and on deck. Bo Harar, Patricia Hunter-Dermis, and then Guy Miller. Um, but now we'll turn to Stacy Valenzuela and Ishbel Dickens. Stacy, go Good ahead. Or who's up? Good members of the Housing Committee. My name is Stacy Valenzuela, and I live at Lakewood Villa Mobile Home Community in the first LD. I implore you to give your full support to Senate Bill 5198. Senate Bill 5198 includes the provision that would encourage landlords to sell the property to a residence association or another eligible organization if they are thinking of selling. Reality is, if this bill had passed last year, 
then everyone in my manufactured housing community would be in a much happier, less concerning position. They would be living in a community owned and preserved by the residents or another nonprofit, and they would not be suffering at the hands of a predatory landlord who did buy the community and immediately raised our rents by 28%. Reality is notice was withheld until after the sale, too late to allow organizations to help. Reality is in the next few years, many of my neighbors on fixed incomes of $900 to $1,200 monthly are being priced out, adding to homelessness in our city, county, and state. The seniors, veterans, those with disabilities, and young families who own their homes and reside in manufactured housing communities are desperate for the opportunity to save their homes. Please help them retain shelter in this unsubsidized affordable housing. Protect any other homeowners from this situation happening to them by giving your full support for Senate Bill 5198. Thank you for consideration today. Thank you, Stacy Ishbel. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Kudra, members of the committee. My name is Ishbel Dickens, and I've been working for and with manufactured homeowners for more than 35 years as a volunteer, as a community organizer, a legal aid attorney, the executive director of the National Manufactured Homeowners Association, and now retired, I volunteer with the Washington Association of Manufactured Homeowners, AMO. I think it's clear to everyone that landlords have a lot of power. They can raise the rent as much as they want, creating economic eviction. In recent months, rents have gone up 25, 28%. In some places, in fact, in a community in Forks, the rent went up from $350 a month to $1,000 a month. Landlords can sell their communities to developers who build fancy condos or build hotels. And they evict homeowners without giving them any compensation for the loss of their homes. Many of these displaced homeowners will never be homeowners again. When a manufactured housing community closes, the landlord, whether mom and pop or com co corporate investor, makes a very substantial profit, and the, the homeowner gets nothing and loses their home. This bill is a fair bill to, to help homeowners move forward with their lives, hopefully keeping roofs over their heads, but at least giving them some time if they have to move out. I heard a very staunch Republican um, homeowner living in the the 20th legislative district said to me the other day he was appalled that no Republican had supported any manufactured housing bill in recent years. Let's work together now with the support of AARP, the Washington uh, League of Women Voters, the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, the Association of Housing Authorities, and many, many others to get this bill passed and keep people housed. Senators Kuder and Frame, I appreciate your leadership on this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ishbel. I would point out that Senator McEwen did do uh, a bill a couple of years ago. You, yes. I beg your pardon. He did indeed. Yes, That's okay. I talked to well, you weren't the one who, it was your, your friend there, but just maybe you want to correct him that we do have <laughs> some support there. Okay. Uh, who's next, Madam Vice Chair? Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's uh, call for Don Lebo, Patricia Hundermas, and Guy Miller, um, if he has shown up on Zoom. And on deck on Zoom, we'll have Rachel uh, Elfenbein, Ann Sadler, and Victoria O'Banion. Don. Okay, Don. Don is missing. Okay. Uh, thank you. Don seems to be missing from Zoom. Is Patricia Hunderdermis available? Yes. Yes, I am available. Um, thank you and good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Patricia Hundermas and I am testifying on behalf of Yakima Valley Landlords Association, uh, which has over 600 members. Um, I am testifying in opposition to this bill. Um, number one, because the obligation of a qualified tenant organization seems to be non-existent. There is no financial obligation to put money down, and there is no financial qualification restriction on whether or not the organization can qualify for a loan. Yet they hold up a sale of a park for more than for 12 months just by saying they want to consider, not that they intend to purchase, just consider to purchase. In regular real estate practices, you must qualify and put money down before holding up a sale. This bill just makes no sense and does not do whatever what it um, proposes to do. Uh, why would the sale of a mobile home park be any different than any other real estate sale? 
The, this bill will cause um, instability, I believe, for tenants of mobile home parks rather than protecting them, which is often the case in government overreach. If this bill passes, many parks will go up for sale or close due to the restrictions of what a property owner does with their own property, as well as I agree with others that it will um, keep people from um, from building new ones. Um, we, uh, I'm going to need would... you to wrap up, please, Patricia. Okay, okay, we'll do. We will. We would support a bill that actually helps tenants and um, uh, from um, greedy speculators. We really would. Um, thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rivers has a very quick question. Patricia, very quickly, we've heard a lot today about the skyrocketing rents that people are experiencing. What do you attribute that to? Well, I attribute it to many things. One being a moratorium for two years where uh, landlords could not raise their rents. Two, for the inflation and the huge cost it is to do any kind of um, remodeling or replacing equipment. Um, it's risen hugely for people that are uh, needing to have these refrigerators or a door replaced, all of those things. So I think the cost of doing business has gone up tremendously. I think um, government interference has caused uh, a lot of, uh, at least a lot of our landlords to sell, which again makes the market smaller. Um, and so in, whenever there's a smaller amount of anything, the price of it goes up. And so I think that's part of it. Um, and I think there is uh, some people just going wild, actually, that are um, buying up these properties and just out of greed. And I and I I can't tell you what the answer to that is. Stopping greed is a very difficult thing. I think we've been trying to do it since 1776. But um, <laughs> I think there are <laughs> I think there are answers out there. <laughs> We would be happy to um, participate as a stakeholder in discussions about how to um, cause that problem to um, be stopped. Great. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, and uh, thank you to the panelists. So, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. We do not yet see Don or Guy on Zoom, so we're going to keep moving along to bring up Rachel um, Elfenbein, Ann Sadler, and Victoria O'Banion. On deck will be Robert Cochran, Krista Connolly, and Joe Dugoni. Uh, so let's go back and start with Rachel. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Rachel Elfenbein. For the past three and a half years, I've been working with a nonprofit organization, Community Council, and community members in Columbia and Walla Walla counties to preserve manufactured home parks because they are one of the only forms of affordable, unsubsidized housing that remain in our communities. The majority of manufactured home park residents in our region are seniors, and most of them live on fixed incomes. Manufactured home parks are almost completely full in our region. If a park were to close and residents were even able to move their homes, there would be nowhere for them to move them to. And if they wanted to stay in our region, many residents would not be able to afford to rent local apartments. To avoid homelessness, many would have to apply for subsidized housing, which may take a year or even more for them to be granted because of wait lists. For these reasons, we have been advocating with manufactured home park residents for opportunity to purchase legislation and manufactured home park zoning. Our advocacy resulted in College Place becoming the first city in Washington state to enact manufactured home park opportunity to purchase legislation in 2021. I urge you to follow College Place's example and support SB 5198, which would provide a statewide opportunity to purchase and assist residents in the event their parks were to close. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Madam Vice Chair. Uh, next should be Ann Sadler and then Victoria O'Banion. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the opportunity to speak with you about Senate Bill 5198 today. For the record, my name is Ann Sadler. I'm 77 years old and live at Bayview Senior Men, uh, Mobile Home Park in Mount Vernon. I love my home and I love my community. 
I'm also president of the Association of Manufactured Homeowners, also known as AMHO, and a board member of the National Manufactured Homeowners Association. I'm here today to ask you for your support of Senate Bill 5198 concerning sale of manufactured mobile home communities and the minimum three years notice of closure. If the landlord does not want to give homeowners three years notice of closure, then it is not unreasonable to expect them to justify, justly compensate homeowners for the loss of their personal property when they're forced to lose their homes through no fault of their own. Homeowners threatened with closure or sale of their communities need time and money. They face the loss of their homes, are forced to relocate, re-enroll their children uh, in another school district, and make arrangements for the removal of their existing home all at the same time. Please help them walk away with something. You can be sure landlords won't go empty handed despite the huge profit they will make on the sale of their land. They can also be compensated by statute for demolition and disposal costs of any home abandoned on their property. Please support SB 59, I'm sorry, 5198, because we are better than this. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Let's pull forward Victoria O'Banion and a reminder who's on deck next, Robert Cochran, Krista Connolly, and Joe Dugoni. Uh, Victoria, back to you. Thank you. My name is Victoria O'Banion. I serve as a representative of the Rock Northwest, a program of the Northwest Cooperative Development Center. To date, we have helped 23 manufactured home communities purchase the land under their home. As a result, there are over 1,000 families across the state living in comfort, knowing that they will be able to live in their owned home as long as they want, and that there will be no drastic rent increases. Let me take a moment to call out some common misunderstandings about manufactured home communities. First, residents already do have the opportunity to purchase the community. In the past three years, I have supported the resident purchase of eight manufactured home communities. Of those eight communities, six were sold off market, six. That means that had I not reached out to the owner at the right time and entered into an assignable purchase and sale agreement, the residents nor any other buyer would not have had the opportunity to purchase. The community would have been sold without public knowledge and the residents simply informed after the ink had dried. Manufactured home communities need to be sold on the open market for all potential buyers to be given the opportunity to purchase. Second, replacing manufactured home communities with more units of multifamily housing is not comparing apples to apples. In reality, it is forcing what was a homeowner to become a renter or potentially homeless. Manufactured housing in many is many Washingtonians' only opportunity to build wealth. That wealth is eliminated when the homeowner is forced to sell their largest investment when the community closes and their, or their lot rent is beyond affordable. In conclusion, I do want to share that this program, the ROC Rock Model, is over 30 years old with 300 resident-owned communities across the country. Not one of those communities has defaulted on their loan. In fact, several of the oldest communities have paid off their mortgage and now own the land outright. A resident-owned purchase has access to funding from a CDFI dedicated to the model. I welcome any questions about the ROC Rock Model. Thank you very much, uh, Robert Cochran. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Robert Cocker from Spokane here speaking in opposition to 5198 on behalf of Contempo Mobile Home Park. This bill is not trying to stop a crime from occurring. This bill is not trying to prevent fraud. What it is trying to do is interfere in legal, normal real estate law and procedures that all property owners in the state follow. An example of the bill's harm Imagine you're a 75-year-old person who owns a very old, peaceful valley mobile home park with many vacancies and 70 current tenants. If circumstances change that are out of your control, you may need to reluctantly close the 1960s park and sell the land. 5198's three-year closure period could be impossible due to time constraints in your circumstances and the final financial burden prolonged closure would add. The bill's 24-month closure option would be impossible due to time constraints and the high cost of perhaps $1,250,000 in relocation payouts. The land sale would barely come to 70% of those costs. 
5198's 12 month closure option would be financially crushing and could leave you a destitute 76 year old senior citizen and heavily in debt. Total cost for your 70 unit park to close would approach $6,800,000, which is far above the current assessed value of what that park would be. The sale of the land after closure would barely offset half that cost. 5198's closure options are all too dire and punitive. They are unconstitutional, posing unduly oppressive burdens. There are no guardrails or incentives in this bill. It is a sloppy collection of mean-spirited penalties intended to cause harm and expense to only one type of property owner and notably leave the tenants, the state, and society off the hook. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's call for Krista Connolly and see if Joe Dugoni has joined us on Zoom and on deck will be Robin McDonald, Jan Leonard, and William Walden. Uh, let's go back to Krista Connolly. Krista, are you there? Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Krista Connolly and I own and operate a manufactured home community uh, in Spokane, and I'm just a small landlord. I also live in my community, so this bill would affect me as a landlord and as a tenant, and I strongly oppose SB 5189 from both perspectives as it's written. The bill seems to assume, as has already been said today, that every sale of a manufactured home community will result in closing that community, and that is simply not the case. There is not a high number of communities that are closing as previously was testified today. In fact, almost every community that sells remains as a manufactured home community. This bill unfairly discriminates against just one type of real estate and housing without any data to support an absolute need for such. What other type of real estate owner has to wait 12 months or even 45 days before being able to sign an agreement to sell their own property? None that I'm aware of. Neither HOAs nor any other party should be given an unfair advantage in private property transactions. The additional requirement of waiting 45 days for a qualified organization to notify the seller of interest in the property in 12 months, if an organization does so, will hurt those communities. Okay. I beat cancer once, and if it comes back, it will be terminal. So a family member of mine who knows nothing about manufactured home landlord tenant laws would have to sell it. This bill would force my family to run this community for potentially more than a year, which would not be fair to them or to the tenants. <clears throat> For multiple reasons, I please encourage you to please vote no on how this bill is currently written today. Thank you. Uh, Joe Dagoni. Are you there, Joe? No. No, Joe. Okay. <laughs> it sounded like I said no joke. <laughs> no, Joe. Um, okay. We'll move to the next uh, panel. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe Jan Leonard is on Zoom and ready to go. Um, we do not yet see Robin McDonald or William Walden. Um, so if Nicole Kurtenbach, Megan Miller, and Tomas uh, Gottlieb could be ready to go, that would be great. For now, let's go back to Jan Leonard. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Senate Housing Committee. My name is Jan Leonard and I live in Golden West Estates, a manufactured housing community in Walla Walla, Washington. I have lived in this house for 15 years and my mother lived here for 10 years before me. Most of the residents are elderly and on fixed incomes. Many are of advanced age and have significant health problems. But with medical facilities, healthcare providers and shopping centers close by, it's a good place to grow old. I love where I live. I love my home and the community I have become a part of. We help each other, look after each other. And the social isolation usually felt by seniors is just non-existent. We choose to be here to age in place and with few exceptions, we have no intentions of moving ever. It was a great shock when a neighboring uh, community was abruptly acquired by an out-of-state corporation. Their rent went up considerably and the landlord continues to find more ways to extract money from them. Many had to leave their homes because they could not afford the increased costs. If SB 5198 had been law, 
maybe these homeowners could have purchased the land with the help of nonprofit agencies and kept rents affordable. We need to save every manufactured home community we can, but it won't be possible if predatory corporations and landlords can come in and ec economically evict our neighbors. We have contributed to our local economies, been good citizens, and are self-respecting independent seniors. Every city should want their senior population to be able to live in peace like we do without fear of eviction because their rent might suddenly become unaffordable. The last thing this state needs is to have thousands of seniors joining the ranks of the homeless. We are counting on you to do the right thing. Please give your full support to SB 5198. Thank you, I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, Jan. Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we are missing all of the folks I called on deck. Uh, team, is Jennifer Brody on Zoom? No, Jennifer. Okay, so I think then let's call forward Russ Millard and Mike Simonich. I think they may be our only folks still on Zoom. Great. Russ, are you there? Yes, I sure am. All right. Please begin. Madam Chair, mem oh, thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for taking the time. I spent 13 years and raised five children in a manufactured housing community. We are housing providers. Our family has never closed a park and never will. There's not an epidemic of closing parks. It's just not true. But many parks that are closing, and that's only 129 out of 70,000. That's almost insignificant as far as the numbers go, are closing in areas where county government or city government has upzoned the property to 40 to 100 units per acre, increased the property taxes and made it unattainable to, to remain there. There's a confusion in this bill that, that conflates uh, selling a park with closing a park. It's not true. But actually when a well-managed manager buys a community, things get better. In Pierce County, one of our members bought a park. The water system was failing. The people couldn't drink the water but the owner borrowed tens of thousands of dollars, changed the water system, and made it so the water is usable. This is what happens when good owners buy property. Yes, the rents went up, but they can drink the water. And did I mention the property taxes went up 22%? And other parks where the pandemic has occurred and people didn't pay water, sewer, or electric for the whole period, people have needed to get money. Let me explain that in this park that closed before, that existed with the water system that was bad before the houses were worth 83,000, after 120,000, that's $40,000 to the tenants. This bill confuses selling a park with closing a park and the uniformity clause of the constitution. We oppose this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, who is next, Madam Vice Chair? Mike Simonich, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Hello, Madam Chairman, and uh, thank you, committee, for uh, letting me speak here. Um, uh, my name is Mike Simonich. I'm the owner of Shelter Management, which is a property management company that specializes in operating uh, manufactured housing communities, and I own a few myself. I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, you know, I, I would echo a lot of the comments that it were just made by Russ and prior testifiers like Krista and uh, uh Connolly and also Christy Mays. So I mean, we could just kind of take a different tack then to not be repetitive. So I think what's frustrated me in the housing debate is that our policies, I think the one thing we can all agree upon is there's not enough units of housing out there. And we've all seen the studies or something, you know, 300,000 units short. I heard testifiers and other bills say we need to develop a million new units for the population coming in. Whatever it is, it's a big number. <clears throat> right now, and then I heard another person talk about how we were 51st, dead last in housing creation and policy. And so right now our, our, our current strategy seems to be instead of creating conditions under which new housing can be created, we want to punish existing housing providers to show that we're accomplishing something. This bill is another example of doing that. It punishes existing housing providers without actually creating new units. Uh, the 129 units out of 72,000 that closed in the last year, if we had been able to create one or two new communities in the state of Washington, we would have actually had a net add of manufactured housing spaces in the state of Washington, but we failed to do that. So I would like uh, everyone to focus on tabling a bill like this and focus on the kind of policies that will increase the supply of manufactured housing in Washington. 
Uh, thank you. Um, I will say we are focused on that as well. Uh, this is a very, um, housing is, is uh, I would say, the number one priority for the legislature. It has been, and it definitely is this session. Uh, and you will be seeing uh, a broad spectrum of policies across the, the housing um, range. So I wanna thank everyone for their testimony today. Um, these aren't easy bills. Uh, but, and, but the testimony is extremely helpful uh, to all of us up here and we appreciate your time very much and we really appreciate when we hear, uh, like we did from some of the testifiers, that they wanna work uh, with the prime sponsor on, on um, her bill. So with that, I don't think we have anybody else. Is that correct, Madam Vice Chair? That is correct, Madam Chair. Okay, um, I mean, again, thanks to everyone who testified uh, today and on this bill in particular. And uh, with that, we are adjourned.